Hey, so our next run is Ultima 4, Quest of the Avatar. This is an... This is the NES port of a pivotal game, uh, sort of like the really define the open world genre. And I have here uh, Squibbins, who is a, a real time runner. She's working on the on uh, with the world record. I bet you'll have it pretty soon. Oh yeah, yeah. It's uh, I love this game and the series overall. So that's yeah. right. I know you've speed run a lot of the different games. Do you have a favorite uh, a favorite game in the series? Uh, Ultima 6, actually. This is a close second, though. Okay. Yeah, I think I would say 7, and but maybe this one is as a, as a close favorite. I really love the PC version. But anyway, let's get started. So um, you can enter the name here. Um, I just put one character. It's important to pick one character because our name is going to get displayed over and over again, um, one frame at a time. So it's important to have one character here. Um, you get to choose your class in the beginning. Um, we're going to pick the Paladin, and this whole section here is a single elimination tournament, basically. Every choice you make is just a um, kind of... Uh, you just have to make sure that you pick Honor every time you get the Paladin. Um, and the Paladin is pretty good pretty much any sort of run you make. Um, the Paladin is going to be the easiest class to pick. So why do we pick the Paladin? It, they've they've got um, so they they've got the best armor, but this is a task. Why do we need armor? Um, well, we're gonna sell it. So we sell the armor, and we buy a bow. Um, we want a ranged weapon because we don't want to wait for the enemies to get close to us. As you'll see. The fights in this game are sort of like a strategic overhead view. Um, so we want to be able to just one-shot the enemies with this bow instead of having to, uh, to shoot them. Yeah, and the Paladin has a couple other advantages too. They're one of the few classes that can equip uh, both the bow and cast really nice uh, spells early on, which is going to be pretty pivotal. Yeah. The, um, we're only starting with 10 MP, but we're going to get more after we take a level up, and then we're going to get even more after we touch some orbs in the dungeon that increase our stats and increase our level up, or in increase our, our stats that give us more MP. So these swamps are really cool. Um, in the tasks, why, one reason why they're really cool is because uh, every time you step on the swamp, it bangs on the RNG to see, did you get poisoned? Did you get poisoned? And we can use that to tweak our, um, to use the RNG more times or fewer times um, to make all sorts of things happen. Um, one of the main things we're doing, well, actually, <laughs> we're manipulating a lot of things in this game. Um, I think, you know, in Crystalis, there was kind of a lot of things being manipulated. In this game, there's probably just as many things. It's kind of not, the action isn't as fast, but... There's still a lot of crazy stuff going on. Um, we're manipulating the enemy groups. We're manipulating um, what, how fast the fights come. We want the fights... We actually want the fights to come faster. We want more random battles um, because we need those fights in order to get our Valor stat up. Um, the other thing we're doing is manipulating higher amounts of gold. Um, we need a lot of gold to buy a few things. Um, there's one thing that's particularly important that you... Um, so, as far as weaponry, if you're playing normally, the bow is okay, but not great. You probably want a better weapon. Um, the other thing, though, is that you absolutely need to have the key. And that costs a lot of money, so we need, we need to get a lot of money here. Um, the other thing we're manipulating is the enemy groups. We want to see one enemy so that we can beat him one time. And the, the gold chest that you get 
is the same no matter whether you fight one enemy or four, which is the most you can see with one person in your party. Um, we also are trying to get... We, you can see we kept fighting those goblins. The reason is because they only take one hit and they give you six experience. Um, and we need enough experience to reach the next level. And so in the task where we're only getting one enemy per battle, um, we kind of need these the enemies with a little higher experience count in order to reach this level up threshold. Yeah, interesting for this game, you only need to be level 4 to beat it, and you start at level 3. Yes. And it's actually easier to beat the game on a lower level with fewer... Uh, it's, you know, if you're just sort of playing casually, it's actually, you know, you probably are going to, like, level up, you're going to keep fighting enemies, and, you know, get these, get the gold, level up, pick up more people in your party, and it's going to get harder, because the enemies are going to be harder, um, as you get more people in your party, the enemy groups that you fight end up getting bigger. So if you have two people in your party, um, you'll probably, you're going to see two to uh, five enemies in every group. Um, there's a really low chance to see one enemy, but it's probably not going to happen that much. Um, so what we just saw in the beginning here, we grinded, we got the rune, you need the the rune of sacrifice is in the forge so you have to sacrifice some hp walking in the forge there and then um you search and you get the rune of sacrifice um and all the money that we had when you death warp you lose it and you end up you always end up with 400 gold when you get revived um however there's a trick if you buy a weapon or anything, so everything you buy, you get to keep. So we blew all our money to buy a expensive sword, and then we're going to be able to sell that sword, um, keeping essentially keeping all the money that we got. Yeah, um, we need a little bit more money here, so we're actually. We're landing real quick so that we can get a fight on land instead of at sea because on land we can um, get a treasure chest and get more money. So how does that beginning look in your real-time run, Squibbins? Uh... <laughs> The real-time run's becoming much more like a Taz at this point because we're manipulating every single combat now. Uh, so, like, for the first, at least the current run I'm practicing at the moment, for the first 38 minutes of the run, every single input is buffered. That's impressive. Uh, so it's supposed to be frame-perfect for the entire... Well, frame-perfect. Uh, the thing is that you have 16 frames in this game to, like, do your next input, but as you do any sort of movements between tiles... Uh, it gives you a little bit of room, uh, but for 38 minutes, it's pretty tough. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty... Uh, you have to be pretty tight on most of them. Um, some of the menus, like, um, w when you're in the menu, I don't think, like, you have to have your, you know, every frame, because uh, the, the RNG doesn't increment. Um, so there's certain times the RNG increments and certain times it doesn't. So anytime the RNG is, is like, live, basically, you have to be frame perfect. Other times you can, you know, just uh, as long as you get it right. Um, so here what we're doing, we're buying herbs, and the herb seller is blind. So you're, you're supposed to be, like, virtuous and honest and pay them the right price just because you're nice. But you can actually just give them one gold and get as many herbs as you want. Which is kind of nice because you need these herbs to cast magic. So we're gonna cheat them. <laughs> um, actually, we cheated them quite a bit. We got we got a bunch of herbs, but we also paid the right price for one of them, and that gave us some virtue points. Um, so this this game has this virtue system where, in order to beat the game, we're gonna have to master all of the eight virtues, and. Uh, so the virtues are honesty, compassion, valor, um, honor, sacrifice, justice, uh, spirituality, and humility. 
and some of these are easy. Like, all you have to do is find a certain NPC and talk to them over and over again, and, it, and we'll see it's pretty easy. But other ones are a little trickier. What's your favorite one? Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's really tough. I, I don't know if I have a favorite actual, like... Uh... I think Moonglow and Honesty are like my favorite pairing oh, because I really like the Mage class. Okay, the Mage is fun. Um, in in the RTA run, you're gonna um, pick the Mage as a um, as a partner, and actually, that was actually a pretty close call in the task too. Um, in some of my um, test runs, I actually picked the Mage. Um, the reason why is because the Mage has the most MP. And so you can actually lean on their MP and beat some of the dungeons a lot faster because you have um, two people that can cast magic. Um, but it turned out that there's adding a second person to the party adds more enemies in the random fights and more kind of menus. There's a lot of menus where once you have a partner, you kind of have to choose. Like you open a chest. Who's going to open the chest? Um, all these things add time. And so that kind of added up to more than they saved over in the dungeon. Um, one of the other virtues, so the other virtues that we need to get that are important here, um, two of them, uh, we said, are sacrifice and compassion. In order to build compassion, the best way is to give money to the beggars. If you give money to the beggar, you get five compassion points. Um, you start out, so each virtue, you start out with 50 and you need to get up to 99. And then when you meditate at the shrine, it goes up to 100. And you can't see these values. You can kind of get a, um, a rough guess if you talk to Hawkwin the Seer in the castle here. He'll tell you something like, thou art progressing greatly in this virtue. <laughs> um, but one of, the, one of the tricks here, you talk to this tree and you tell him, you know, dost thou enjoy the pitiful destruction of innocence? Of course not. And he says, thou art a wimp. And so every time he tells you you're a wimp, you gain like five, it's like three or four different virtues. And that's going to make it really easy to max out those virtues. Um, there's, another, there's another NPC that'll come up later um, that'll get us one more virtue. The rest of them, we're going to have to get a little... The rest of them are going to get a little tougher. Um, so, compassion and sacrifice we get from the beggars. So, it turns out you get five compassion if you give money to a beggar. But, if you give all of your money to a beggar, you also get five sacrifice. Um, so, I'm, I'm putting a, a Lua script that's hacking this game a little bit. Um, we're gonna see. We're gonna be able to see where we're going in the dungeons without casting a light spell. It's not a big. Um, it's not a big optimization. And when I was playing this game RTA, one of the things I discovered was if you learn the dungeons pretty well, you can actually play um, without casting the light spell and just sort of like go blind. All right. So this castle. This castle is called Serpent's Hold. Um, there's three castles for the principles, love, truth, and courage. This is the castle for courage. Um, there's nothing we need here, plot-wise. None of the, no required items. However, there's a beggar right in front of the door, and we've got to give money to these beggars over and over again to max our virtues. So, um, we're going to go to this castle just because we can give to this beggar particularly fast, and it's, um, it kind of works in the route here. So this beggar... He's in the right spot. He's going to get a lot of money. We're going to give give to him six or seven times. That's going to get our compassion and sacrifice up because every time we give him every single gold that we've got. <sighs> Almost like a donation? That's right. It could be like a donation. Like, uh, I don't know. How about this one real quick? We've got $10 from Northeast who says, Hi, Giant. Hello. All right. So another thing we're manipulating, um, we're manipulating not just enemies, but we're also manipulating the winds. So you saw we got on that balloon earlier. Normally, when you get on the balloon, the winds, you, you can't actually just control the balloon and tell it where to go. 
Instead, you go wherever the winds blow, but you can cast a spell that changes the direction of the wind. But you notice we didn't do that. We just got on the balloon, and it happened to be going in the right direction. Um, and that's that's going to happen again. <laughs> because um, we can actually manipulate the, the direction the winds are blowing. Um, there's base So internally, it keeps track of whatever direction the winds are blowing, even when you're not on the balloon. And it also kind of has this duration counter. And then when that duration um, goes down to zero, then it re-rolls, you know, a new direction and a new duration. So by looking at that and look and keeping track of the time when that wind switches, you can actually control where the where the wind's moving. So yes, in this game we get to manipulate the winds. I believe in the PC version, it actually affects the ship as well. Uh... That's right. The the ship can like move a lot faster if the winds are blowing in your direction. So this town is Cove. Um, you've seen a couple times we've talked to someone. The reason why you talk to the NPCs are to get a spell. Um, there's a Spells Unlimited shop in Moonglow. And in order to get a spell, you've got to talk to an NPC somewhere in the world, then go to this shop and say, uh, register the spell, put it in your spell book. And you have to, in order to kind of do it, you have to tell them the... Um, the ingredients for the spell, but it won't even show up on the list. So even if you know the ingredients, you can't sort of like cheat and just tell them. You actually have to talk to the NPC. Um, and most of the time, the NPC will actually tell you straight up, you know, here are the ingredients, this is how you cast this spell. But the first one, it wasn't the case. They said something like, um, I have been studying odd order. What, what does that guy say? It's something like odd order intermodulation and whatever. Yeah, it's, it feels like they say nonsense. <laughs> the, yeah, they should be saying here is how thou dost cast the tremor spell because that's when you get. And it's actually like the best spell. We're going to be using it a lot. Um, so In the this actual is, game, there's a there's a quest line for that spell and each there's characters that will tell you the ingredients who are not that character but that character is the one who unlocks the spell yes it's kind of it's kind of misleading because yeah none of them actually tell you the spell they look like they're the ones they actually tell you the ingredients for the spell but they're not the kind of the trigger um so we saw this little balloon uh journey we got uh, to Cove. You can actually also get there from a whirlpool, but that one's the whirlpool. I think it's out of the way. And actually, there's a glitch in this game, right, where the whirlpool is invisible. It's there, but it's invisible, and the location like resets every fight. So uh, probably it didn't get very good testing. No, we just like looked into that recently and found that the whirlpool kind of sits. It's actually pretty close to the path, oh. like, but it's very difficult to tell if it's actually usable. Uh, I mean, even if you could use it, it would kind of mean you'd have to get an extra ship at some point because your ship would end up on the lake. Um, that would get you to Cove. Um, you need that. You need the balloon anyway to get to um, Serpent Spine, the place where we got the white stone. Um, so. You know, it kind of worked out in the route to use that and get to Cove. Um, what we needed in Cove uh, was that, that candle, the candle of love. Um, and here, um, we actually need to get uh, these eight runes. There's a rune for each virtue. You need the rune in order to enter the shrine, and you have to edit, um, meditate at the shrine in order to max out the virtue and become the avatar. So we need to get all these runes. Oh, and here's, coming up here, another thing that we're manipulating, the moons. So yes, we were manipulating the moons in this run. Um, the way we did that is actually, um, there's a counter, uh, every eight steps, the moons shift. So the, you see the moon on the right shifts um, every uh, three cycles, the moon, the moon on the right shifts, and then the moon on the left shifts. So that's every eight steps that you take. Every 16 frames is one step. So either you stand still for 16 frames or you move. Um, and that cycles the moons. 
So if we get the a fight like right before the 16 frame or right before that eight step boundary or right after it, we can kind of affect how the moon cycle. So we're actually controlling uh, when the moon cycle so that we were able to get so that we were able to get that um, that uh, moon gate to show up right at that right at the right time where we needed it and take us right where we needed to. Um, that's yeah, that's one of the more satisfying things you can do in a task is when you can kind of like make these really crazy things happen and it just sort of all works out. But I guess in the real time run, since you're mani you're doing you know routing and stepping you know kind of like a, a task level manipulation, you get to do that too. There's some things that are a little beyond <laughs> that make it very <laughs> difficult. Uh, so the pulling off this stuff, like the full Taz uh, as a human, is actually extraordinarily difficult. So the the real time route is even if we're doing a lot of buffering and trying to like be as perfect as possible, it still has to deviate. Uh, yeah. And manipulating the moons is definitely not possible in our, our, our current mm -hmm. runs. Not to this degree, not down okay. to the like frame. We still yeah. manipulate them to be about where we need them within you know a second or two. And there's a lot of details with the fights in particular. Like, um, so in every fight, of course, we want one enemy so that we can beat it in one round. But then the other thing is, I'm also manipulating it so that the enemies are closer. You see the enemy is right next to us. Um, and that's so that we don't have to wait for our shot to go all the way across the screen. You know, who, who has time to wait for your shot you know, for half a second while your shot goes across the screen when you can just, you know, shoot them right away? You also manipulate the uh, miss table, the miss and hit table, right? Um, well, that's the thing the missing of the so the the um hit and miss of your of your shots uh i guess you we're not really manipulating it we're kind of routing around it really um the thing is we actually can't manipulate that it's not um you can't make every shot hit because it's based on a counter rather than the rng um the way that works is every time you use your bow and attack an enemy it actually increments a counter and there's a different counter for each enemy slot so like the enemy in the first slot has its has its counter and the enemy in the second slot has its counter and so every time you you um, use your bow it increments this one counter and when that counter overflows you miss so if you keep attacking with the bow you're gonna miss you you kind of uh you can't avoid it because there's there's no rng involved um, the amount that your the amount that that counter goes up each round um, depends on your stats. So you can, uh, if you have better stats, you will miss less, but you still can't avoid it. So now That's we're going to get some. Of... Oh, oh go ahead. we're going to get some interesting <laughs> fights now that we're in the dungeon. Um, but what was it? We... Oh, I was going to say, that's one of the actual interesting parts that we can't route in the actual real-time run, because the uh, counter for that is stored in the actual like save data for the game. That's right. And even if you don't start, if you start a completely new game, it has the counter from the old game. So that's yes. just constantly rotating. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, Final Fantasy, which we'll see later in this event. Um, Final Fantasy also stores a random uh, a random number seed in SRAM, and so when you um, when you start your uh, when you start your game, even if you're you know starting a new game, it's still loading that from the from the old game because it's, it's stored in that part of the cartridge. Um, one of the things you can do, well, you know, at a task level. Um, you can actually, you know, send, you, if you can um, put, have your cartridge, you can like clear, you can clear that RAM programmatically. And the emulator, of course, we kind of have a, a, a starting state. And for task videos, um, there's a very specific sort of like setup that has zero, zero on every, you know, on every memory bit. Um, and that sort of makes for a consistent starting point. 
this is the probably the hardest room, and it's just because all of these enemies have like shots or uh, magic. So it's the, really the only one that we couldn't kind of get perfect. Uh, and that's just because there's all these enemies, they take a lot of hits, and all we can really do is set up this lava. Um, we did pretty well here. One of the um, bonuses to the lava is that when they die in it, it uh, doesn't spit the XP and all the death text up there, so it's way faster. Yes. And we actually, we don't need any more experience. Um, like we said earlier, you only need level four to beat the game, and we've got it, so we are we are good to go on experience and gold. We don't need the gold anymore. Actually, we will we will need gold. We'll need one piece of gold, which I we picked up earlier, um, and we'll see when we use that. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we don't need experience. So if we can kind of get the enemies to die without giving us experience and without getting that sort of like dialogue, it's it's kind of nice. Uh, and that energy, yeah, that energy spell is just really cool. You can. Um, we use that a lot. You can manipulate, uh, if you use that with a good strategy, a good setup, um, you know, it kind of makes things a lot faster. So let's see, how many virtues have we got? We got um, compassion earlier. We stopped by there. So I think this is uh, number two. This is, this is the Shrine of Honesty. Every time you meditate at a shrine, um, you get to pick one, two, three cycles. And if you, it doesn't, for getting Avatar Hood, it doesn't matter. So we only pick one cycle because if you pick more cycles, then the cooldown. So if you go, if you meditate and then come back in and try to meditate again, it'll say thy thoughts are still weary. So in order to kind of get that to cool down faster, we only pick one. Um, and the cooldown is 60 steps. So you got to take 60 steps in the outer world in order to cool that down. And there's actually similar cooldown timers for like almost everything. Things like um, giving money to the beggar, which is why we can't just keep giving money to the beggar. Um, or some even, even like talking to people. A lot of different things have this sort of cooldown to keep you from sort of doing it over and over again. We took this long ship, uh, we took this voyage down the river. Um, to go in this dungeon, we're, we're routing the dungeons so that we can go in the top of some dungeons and then later on we'll go, um, we'll have a way to go to the bottom of the dungeon. There's eight floors in each dungeon um, and some of them are a little faster to come from the top, um, that is enter from the outer world and then go down to get the stone. Um, we have to get the, uh, so there's eight stones, one for each virtue. Six of them will be in the dungeons, and two of them that we've already gotten aren't. So the black stone and the white stone. The rest of them, we're going to have to dive these dungeons to get. And so uh, this is the, the each dungeon corresponds to one of the virtues, which has its own color. This is the dungeon of shame, which is the uh, that corresponds to honor. One thing that happened last dungeon was you collected uh, orbs to increase your dexterity stat, which That's right. in this game, in the NES version, the dexterity and intelligence stats are flipped. So it actually increases your mana, uh, while int increases your attack speed in this game. <laughs> That's right, yeah. It's, 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 a, it's kind of weird, but if you actually look at your stats, but... You know, most of the stats don't really matter except for that, um, except for that, uh, yeah, that deck stat that increases your MP. Like, mo none of the other stats really make a difference. Well, I guess you do, so you do miss fewer times. You'll, you can see if you really max out your, um, your int stat to get your, um, uh, to get your fewer misses. You, you will see that you'll miss less often, but. I forgot to ask you in the last dungeon, Squibbins. Dost thou ever lie to thyself or to others? Uh, yes. <laughs> then thou hast earned the blue stone of honesty. <laughs> 
The right. answer to the question is always yes, which I think there's like some translation issues there. It's it's really uh, a little weird, but um, so yeah, you, you, you always say yes, um, except for this dungeon. We'll see the question is different, but um, the answer is always yes. And sometimes it, it, that seems a little weird, but just, just say yes. That's yeah, that's the way to go. Yeah, it's an interesting aspect that you mentioned translation here because this is a port of a PC American game, but actually it was <laughs> ported to Japanese, and then that version a year later was ported back to English as this game. So this is actually has a massive amount of mistranslations from the Japanese version and didn't pull text over from the English version. <laughs> That's right. I highly recommend playing like the original NES version, like even though it's a really old, you know, 1985 DOS game, like it's really good. Um, it, it stands up fairly well for, you know, as far as being a classic. And, you know, this game really did establish like the open world concept um, historically. Uh, you know, Richard Garriott, who made this game, is, is a genius. He's kind of established multiple genres of, of video games. So yeah, all that right. work... I oftentimes tell people about this series in description as it is the predecessor to things like, you know, the Elder Scrolls series. Like, those games wouldn't have existed without games like this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and in fact, I mean, it's also a predecessor to, like, um, the Japanese, uh, even Japanese RPGs, because when they were making, you know, it predates, like, Dragon uh, Dragon Warrior, Dragon Quest, um, and when they were making this, the, something I was kind of researching recently, um, the makers of Dragon Quest actually looked at this game, and, um, or maybe the earlier Ultima games, and some of the other ones that were out at the time. And that was sort of their um, starting point for creating the JRPG genre. They looked at this and said, that's pretty neat, but we want to make it a little easier and a little more accessible. So that's that was how they ended up with the JRPG style. Okay, so at this stone room, instead of asking a question, he says, give me a donation. And if you don't have any money to give him, He'll, or you give him nothing, um, he'll actually toss you out of the dungeon. If you answer the question wrongly or don't give that beggar money, um, he's, you know, you don't get your stone, they give you a nasty response and say, you know, be gone, and you get thrown out of the dungeon, you don't get your stone, and you've got to go back in the dungeon again. So you kind of have to be careful when you answer these questions or... Um, uh, you have to make sure that you don't give him zero gold. There's a lot of things where it's like, uh, especially if you're speed running it, that's the end of your run. I mean, you're, you're it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it could be bad. So I'm actually going to be, I, I was, it was, I was supposed to do it this year at RPG Limit Break, but now it's going to be next year. Um, this is going to be, um, I'm going to do this run at RPG Limit Break, and that's actually going to be the first Ultima run at an RPG Limit Break. I was a little surprised that this series hasn't been at RPG Limit Break, um, so I submitted this, and, and um, it turns out Jire also submitted, so um, we'll both be doing Ultima for, um, for the next RPG Limit Break. Okay, so we're using the gate spell that we got earlier. The gate spell lets you travel around. Um, you can you can just, instead of waiting for the moon gates to line up, you can just instantly teleport to a um, any of the eight gate locations, and you're there. Um, if you do it at the same time that that moon gate is open, you'll sort of instantly chain. So if you don't want to do that, then you better be careful what the moons, uh, what the moons are. Um, you see, we also took another Death Warp. This is just for routing. Um, we got the Rune of Valor. It's also in a damage area. It's really deep in this town. We had to go all the way through here, all the way into the walls. Um, but that death sequence takes a while. And because of that, this actually isn't a huge time save. 
Um, but it is nice because we want to be in this castle. We also, um, uh, so we don't care about the money, but we do get our HP and MP refilled, which is kind of nice. We're going to take this um, back entrance into the dungeon of Hithloth. So Hithloth is kind of this, all of the dungeons have an entrance in the outer world. And, and I guess Hithloth does too. You saw earlier we went in here and we just cast the exit spell. And that took us to the place where the balloon was. This time we're going to go straight down. We're going to go all the way down to the bottom. And we're going to enter the altar rooms. So there's three altar rooms. One for each principle, love, truth, courage. And each altar room um, has a, a place where you can kind of, you can get the keys. So we need to get the three keys of, of principle. In order to do that, we need the, um, all the stones. And we've got some of them. Um, we need to get the rest of them. The next one is in, uh, and we're gonna get them by going in the dungeons from the bottom. So all of the dungeons are connected through these altar rooms. We can go between them um, easily now. And we've got this Tremor spell. The Tremor spell, we can instantly slaughter all the enemies real fast. Pretty nice. It takes 40 MP. So that was why we needed to kind of like go through this, all this effort to increase our um, MP earlier. All right, the next question. Art thou one who would withhold thy blood <laughs> from from a, a, a person in need? I think it's something like that. Yes, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, the manipulation in this, um, in the dungeons, the, you're constantly, so as you wait in the dungeons, the RNG is moving while you're stopped. When you move in the dungeons, so uh, in the frames that you're moving, it's actually not. And this is one of the differences, we can actually move one frame faster by pressing um, one frame per step faster by pressing the button at the right time in the dungeons. So you can kind of move every 15th frame instead of every 16th frame. And that um, that keeps your, it keeps the counter from going. So that keeps the counter that um, adds to the enemy of the random battles. There's random battles in the dungeons, um, in sort of the dungeon hallways here. But since we're moving faster, that counter doesn't go down or it doesn't up, whatever. All right, the next question. Dost thou flee from the malevolent face of danger? Yes, of course, with the avatar. Um, yeah, one of the interesting things you mentioned about this is the dungeons and the, all the RNG manipulation that goes on in them. This is actually one of the parts that is impossible to do in the real-time run. So for a real-time run, we don't do any dungeon manipulation and we basically up front do all of the overworld as early as possible before ever entering a dungeon that's right yeah you'd have to be pretty precise i think yeah i'm not sure maybe if you buffered it you could do it in the dungeons i don't know but the thing is, in the dungeons, it's every frame. So there's no... That 16-frame rule um, is kind of gone, but only when you're stopped. If you are holding the button, uh, as soon as you start moving, you could do it, I think. But you'd have to be perfect. Like, you'd have to have, have the button... Like, as soon as you go into the dungeon, you'd have to, like, have the button held down. And there's a little trick here in the dungeons. Every time you go up or down a ladder, if you don't hit, it, hit anything then you'll get this message that says, do you want to take the ladder again and go up? You know, if you just went down. Um, so we're avoiding that. What you do, if, if you buffer any button and you move, then you, uh, uh, then it'll avoid that dialogue. So this one, the weird dialogue isn't on the question, but on the answer. He actually says, you know, I can't grant you the stone, leave. But the, open the box. Well, we got the stone, so it's all good. But still. 
I think that's literally my favorite one of all of them. <laughs> yeah. I can't give it to you. Open it. That was the last stone. Um, one of the things I want to point out on the RNG here is every time we step on lava or any damage tile, that's RNG, and we can manipulate that. Um, which I can imagine is useful on the outer world for like swamps because you can manipulate it not to get poisoned, which is really big because it means you won't have to cast the cure spell and heal heal your poison all the time. Um, so on the uh, the on lava squares though, your damage varies between zero and fifteen. Although I think for the for the av so for you, the avatar, um, it varies between zero and thirty, um, and for the enemies, it's zero to fifteen. Um, so you can actually take zero damage if you kind of manipulate it just right, and even if you step on lava. Uh, those swamp tiles also randomly poison you, which is really annoying. Um, Although you did see that we got poisoned earlier on, and we didn't worry about it because we actually wanted to run down our MP. Our, we actually wanted to run down our HP to die at the right point. So at RPG limit break, I am not going to be manipulating it at all. It's going to be um, a no R no RNG manipulation run, which is a little scary because there's a lot of a lot of a lot of RNG in this game, but it, it makes it interesting. I've also routed a shepherd uh, run, not as a task, but as um, as a non-manipulated run, which is fun. It, it's the shepherd is sort of the ultimate swag character. Yeah, for a lot of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> the, not only does the shepherd not get um, magic, she uh, um, she can't cast. She doesn't get any. Um, she can't equip any of like the weapons or armor. Like your best weapon is like a club and a sling. <laughs> um, and I think I actually like you can actually go in the final dungeon with a club and a sling and you know beat it. <laughs> it's you know a little tricky, but you can make it. You um, so when you become the avatar, your um, your max MP becomes 99, which means you'll be able to cast all the magic. The only thing that prevents any character from casting any spell is amount of MP. Um, so you can see, even though um, we're a paladin, we're able to cast all the most powerful spells in the game just because we've got enough MP. Um, if you get the mage, her MP starts out at 52, so you'll be able to cast all the spells right away. That's uh, one reason why there's such a great pickup. Um, so another mandatory uh, quest item basically is these three items for each virtue so one was the uh, the book of truth we got that in the in the library at the Lyceum there was the candle of love which was we got in Cove that town on the lake and then that last one the bell of courage uh, we're gonna need those to open the final dungeon this game is like really free form which is why we said it's like um, the predecessor to all these open world games like you can explore the world there's all sorts of people to talk to that kind of tell you what to do but in the end you can route it out however you want all you got to do eventually you've got to master the virtues you know meditate at the shrine get your avatar hood and kind of collect all these items and then you open the final dungeon and beat it um so it's really really open that way it diverges from the first three because the first three have sort of a final boss enemy character archetype that you need to yeah. defeat. But this is the first in the series that doesn't do that. There is no final boss that doesn't exist. The, there's no antagonist in this game. So I read about that. Um, it's actually really neat how Richard Garriott, you know, figured this out. He did the first three games and uh, he, he was working with like a publisher and he asked them, you know, hey, did you guys get any fan mail for me that I, I'm curious what everyone thought? And they said, oh, we just throw it away. And he said, what? <laughs> so for, I think it was the, for the third one, he actually started his own company and just made the game himself and distributed all the distribution just so he could see the fan mail and get some ideas on making, you know, new game. 
and that was how he kind of got a lot of the ideas for this. People were saying, you know, oh, it's, it's the game you just kind of go through and you got to beat this big dragon at the end. You know, what do you do? I want, I want something, you know, bigger. And so he thought of, you know, I want to make this, you know, neat. And he came up with this formula for, you know, instead of just being a dragon, let's become the paragon of virtue, the avatar. And I believe the origin for the Ultima name is he wanted to make the ultimate RPG or the ultimate adventure game or maybe just the ultimate game. And so he says, well, we'll call this series Ultima. I mean, I think, Rich, you know, he was really young when he when he made this. So he, was, he was probably, you know, uh, just out of school. I don't know if he dropped out or what, but... Um, yeah, it was the, his first game was in 79, I believe. Like, the yeah. first Ultima was 80. Uh, yeah, really, yeah. As you can see, very, very historic. You know, 1985 with the original version of this game. And this is the fourth in the series. And at this point, when you, the, they define the Avatar and this this world map, for the rest of the series, that sort of lore sticks. Like they sort of found what the real the series was really about at this point. Uh, and so all the rest of the games use the same overworld map albeit slightly changed, but it's the same kind of overall locations. Yeah, yeah, the world of Britannia. Um, the, one of the, 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 um, the things that you, you hear a lot is the cloth map that came with the game. I didn't bring any of mine, but um, you know, I, ha I have them for some of the games, and they kind of put these, you know, the cloth map and the, like a little um, actual charm in the game. I mean, I don't know about you, I've actually played through every Ultima game um, a great experience, um, even Ultima 9, if you're, you know, just because you, just because it's man, you know, if you play through 1 through 8, you've got to play through 9. Um, so Ultima, the origin, um, uh, you know, Richard Garriott's company, and then, you know, they made a lot of other cool games too. Um, you know, you, you might've heard of Wing Commander, but, um, so... They they made all the Ultima games, and then they made um, they made Ultima Online, which it wasn't the first um, massive online game, but it was like sort of defined the MMO genre. So you know, not only did he define this open world RPG genre, he also defined effectively you know um, MMOs, and that became so successful that they at that point they pretty much had to focus on that. And they got acquired by um, uh, EA for like millions. I think like their actual acquisition price wasn't that high, but it was in stock. And then EA did really well. And so Richard Garriott, the founder of the, the you know, the creator of this game and the founder of Origin, he became a billionaire, a multi billionaire. And he's maybe, I don't, yeah, I don't know if he's a multi billionaire. He was rich enough to go to space. He was one of the first guys that that, um, you know, put a money and, and became a space tourist on the Russian space station. All right, we're in the final dungeon. The final, you know, you can see on the timer here, 47 minutes. Um, so out of this run, we're going to spend about 15 minutes in the final dungeon on a one hour run. Um, that's how long this dungeon is. It is pretty gnarly. Um, and that is using our tremor spell. We're going to use our tremor spell and just blast our way through everything. And it's still going to take 15 minutes because there's a lot of enemies in the way. No matter what you do, you always end up with one character. So even if you have, um, if you have a full party, um, you leave them all at the entrance to the abyss. You know, only the avatar can go in, I guess. Which is different from the other versions of the game, where you get to, where you do take everyone in. And all of these questions at, at the so in the abyss, instead of um, taking the ladder, you've got to go to that cup, and the the thundering voice booms and asks you the question. You know, which virtue is made of these principles, and then put the the stone in there. And if you mess up either answer, it's booted out of the dungeon sorry you will not be finishing your run today
And interestingly enough, that can happen after the very last room. The one room before you finish the game, it can boot you all the way back out of the dungeon. Yes. You can actually get all the way to the end, beat every single enemy, and just be one dialogue entry away from finishing and mess it all up. Um, another way you can mess it up is if you forget to get that black stone. Um, you saw that was one of the first key items we got. Um, if you can remember, it was like a minute in. We picked up that black stone at the double new moon gates near Moonglow. Um, that is necessary, and you, but it's not necessary until the very, very end. And if you don't have it, you will not finish. But you'll get pretty close. <laughs> so some of our choices on the routing are probably a little bit different, um, partly because we can tremor every fight here. Um, and get get an instant kill. Um, some of the other, uh, if you're, uh, if you don't kind of have manipulation, then you might pick the fights based on which fights have fewer enemies that can put you to sleep. Um, you know, when you're in a dungeon with a lot of brutal enemies and you're trying to get through to beat the game, you don't want to fall asleep. Not not the right time. <laughs> No, and some of these rooms can permanent sleep lock you too, because there's no yes. like, there's no there's no chance that it's gonna happen. Yeah, and that's why you know it's uh, there's sort of uh, it's sort of unsafe. Um, you never really know if it's gonna happen. The odds are pretty low, especially if you make sure your HP is high before you go into kind of one of these real risky rooms. Your odds are pretty low. You probably make it. Um, I've, you know, I've done a lot of practice runs for RPG Limit Break since I'm, you know, planning on going through this without any luck manipulation. Um, I'm pretty sure uh, my odds are pretty low, but I, I, I did kind of tell them, you know, hey, I, I can't guarantee that I won't, you know, <laughs> that I won't scrub this. Um, you know, one of the things, I can, I can make a safety save, but it's, uh, it's still a pretty big loss. Um, because, you know, like I said, it's 15 minutes in a task. It's easily 20 minutes or more in a regular run. Yeah, and you can only save... In, you can't save at any point in this game. You can only save at ends. So it's not like you could save in the dungeon. Yeah, yeah, you can't save in the dungeon. I think the safety save would be, like, at Jellum right before, right before setting off for the dungeon. So it's still kind of, like, a pretty good trip. Um, so you can see in the final dungeon, a lot of rooms we use Tremor, um, but that's not our only uh, not our only trick. We can still just break out that bow, and you know, and shoot them down. And one reason why we do that is because we've got limited MP. Um, we can recover our MP by walking, but that takes time. So if we can efficiently beat them with our bow, then we'll go ahead and do that. Um, one of the things we're doing, if the enemies can shoot back. We manipulate them to not. Um, all the enemies have kind of like um, randomness in their movement or in their actions. So like this tree can do all sorts of nasty stuff. But we're manipulating just keep moving for, uh, forward. And so we keep shooting at him and we take him down pretty easily. And every round in battle you regain an MP. So instead of um, using MP on magic, you actually gain it back. This is one of the scarier rooms that um, Balrog enemy in the middle can put you to sleep. And if he does, there's all sorts of other enemies that do a lot of damage that can really nail you. Um, so that's one of the rooms where you're more like, where um, there's a pretty good chance to die. Um, so we're on the seventh floor now. Uh, getting getting close to the end, but these, these last two floors are going to gonna have some some trouble for us one of the differences here between the real-time run and the taz 2 is uh the spells you're using because you can manipulate trimmer here which you can't do in the rta run uh you get to use it for for nearly all the battles but in the rta run we actually pick up a different spell called squish which you don't even get in this run because it's not That's necessary right. 
Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Squish basically does a percentage damage to everything in the room, kind of making them much more, well, squishy. <laughs> So yeah, uh, Squish is, is fun, because, you know, you, you get the enemies all down, and then, like, you can shoot them in one shot. Um, if you get them down, like, real low, the Squish can kill them, and, you know, it can't actually kill them, but only if their HP, like, is real low. But Squish, the advantage for Squish is it always hits every enemy. So you kind of get this trade-off between hitting every enemy for some damage or killing some enemies. And you can kind of, like, pick... Um, you know, even in a, to, you know, to really go for all out on a, you know, even on an RTA run, you're probably going to use Tremor quite a bit because if you can kill the enemies right away, you know, that's, that's obviously faster, but, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, it can be risky, of course. This is another room that can be pretty nasty. Um, you know, those, those, um, like sea snakes and the, the, I think they're like cyclopses. They can, you know, they can shoot. They can do heavy damage. Um, and then that tree and the Balrogs can turn, can put you to sleep with a sleep spell. So there's all sorts of, you know, ways things can go sideways. Um, this is sort of one of the fi well, we're on the last floor of the final dungeon here. We still have some rooms to go, um, and they're all like packed with really tough enemies. You know, they didn't go, they didn't, uh, they didn't pull any punches at the end here. Like, you've got to go through these dungeons. You've got to beat, like, every set of the toughest enemies um, by yourself solo. So, you know, you, you've got to be ready for it. But if you got the Tremor spell and, you know, a good range, a good bow, you know, you are. And of course, we've got to have our RPG dinos here. <laughs> this, was, this is another good room for, for Squish. So one of the things that comes up with Squish is if you use Squish and you get their, their HP down, then uh, and they step on the lava, you can get the lava kill. Now we're going to do something fun here. This is one of the fun things you can do in a TAS. Um, get down to one HP just for swag points. <laughs> we're going to beat these guys. Uh, we're going to be at one HP when we beat the end here. And these fights are really hard. Um, this fight, the famous mirror fight, I think they wanted to tell you, you know, hey, the real enemy is yourself. And this final fight, this one has the three enemies that can put you to sleep and then four other really hard enemies. So, you know, you had, we have to beat um, all these fights uh, in a row. But we do. And now, make sure that you don't hold down down, because you'll go back into the room and not be able to just leave. There's a few, like, inputs at the end that can be, like, you can kind of go wrong and really screw yourself. But here's the end. Um, I think time will be when we hit the... Uh, uh, go through the top here because that's when you lose control. And... Oh. Oh, uh, uh, well, my, I, I don't have my live split configured, but... Anyway, that was... Uh, that's the time on this game. Um, and that is Ultima 4, the quest of the Avatar. In the end here, we, we say hello to everyone. We say, um, and we're congratulated by Lord British, who is uh, Richard Garriott, the creator. It's his persona is Lord British, of course. There are various mems in the different Ultima games where you get to kill Lord British, even though he is sort of this invincible, all-powerful Lord of Britannia, who for some reason still needs a hero to kind of do his dirty work. And although the adventure is at an end, the quest of the Avatar is forever. Well, thanks to everyone for watching this, and thanks uh, again to Squibbins for, for joining us for this run here. Oh, thank you. This was actually quite fun. 
I love this series, so it's always it's always fun to participate in these. Yeah. And so you play you you've been working on the speed run and you actually play a randomizer for this game, right? Yeah, that's actually true. So there is a randomizer from someone named Gilmock. Uh and it's uh, for the U, the NES version of Ultima 4. Uh, it's super fun. <laughs> it was heavily inspired by the Dragon uh, Quest uh, randomizer. And ah. uh, it's, or sorry, Dragon Warrior randomizer, not Dragon Quest. <laughs> Dragon Warrior randomizer. Uh, but it is incredibly fun. I definitely would recommend people checking it out. Cool. Um, and this run is on task videos. Um, I, there's an annotated version with like some commentary that explains, you know, a lot of the mechanics and, you know, there's an hour. So I have some like commentary just on explaining the, the Ultima series and a few other things. So go ahead and uh, check this out on task videos. Um, and if you're interested, is there like an Ultima task discord or community? Or Ultima speedrunning? What is, what is it called? There, yes, there is an actual Ultima Speedruns community. Uh, it's a Discord that's basically linked to every single Ultima game on the uh, speedrun.com forums. So, like, there's a Discord link, and it goes. they all go to that speedrunning forum. Okay. Great, yeah. Yeah, the, you know, a lot of the Ultima games... I, I want to try, personally, I want to try speedrunning um, Ultima 7... Uh, maybe as a human, I'm not sure if, if um, you know, you could get a solid run in DOS box. That would be a task, but I mean, it's a pretty short run, so that would be a fun one too. Seven's actually an incredibly fun run. I actually find most of the Ultima series to be quite fun. I've run three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. I've got notes for one and two, but I haven't run them yet. But okay. Seven is is a very good run. <laughs> it's very fun. Interesting. You know, in, in the third one, there's also an NES port on the third game, Ultima Exodus. Actually, there's NES ports for, I think, 5 and 6, too. Or maybe 5 is on the NES and 6 is on Super Nintendo. Something that like that. Um, and I, I think there might be TASs for them. Um, and there's also, there might be DOS, ta DOS box TASs. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of Ultima runs to check out. It's, it's, it's a it's a really fun series. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you guys so much for that. Thank the you, the Axeman once again, and Squibbins on the couch. Some uh, true experts in <laughs> uh, in this whole series. That was incredible. Um, well, I tell you what, uh, towards the end of that run there, we got a donation in from Uncle Dave who said, uh, watching Ultima 4 get completely decimated is just fascinating. <laughs> Never could get through it on PC when I was younger. Maybe, uh, maybe he learned uh, a trick or two that he might be able to use in the future. Well, I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> 